Welcome again to our course on Biodesign, Strategies for Innovation and Design on Bioengineering. Today we're going to talk about treatment options. Treatment options are relevant for the biodesign process because it's going to tell you what is out there and what is not. And it's important for you to know because even if you are, haven't thought about a possible solution for the problems that you have already detected, to know the current treatment options are essential uh, for knowing what you can do and what you should not do and if those treatment options are really addressing the problem or if they are not and if they are not then it can give you a hint on the type of problems that you have to choose uh, to be innovative and to affect uh, the greatest number of people. So if we go to the first slide on objectives, you can see that our uh, goals here are to appreciate the value of understanding treatment options of a given disease state or problematic state. Uh, to know how to effectively search for and summarize for treatment options uh, in a useful format because what you're going to see is that for many problems you're going to uh, find many options but not all that information is going to be re readily available if you think on exploring the web page of each and every one of those solutions. So to put them on a useful format is going to make your life uh, easier when thinking on new uh, treatment options that address a, the problem from the root cause. Um, also an objective is to understand how to perform a gap analysis that can lead you to the identification of the opportunities, the real opportunities in the treatment landscape. And we're going to finalize this uh, section with a small practical course that is going to uh, explore a little bit on the concept on epidemiology and disease state fundamentals from last lecture and of course on all the concepts that we address in this presentation. So a treatment, uh, so the very first thing to do in, in a treatment option analysis, if we go to the next slide, is a treatment cost benefit analysis. And a very useful format for doing this is by comparing the, all the different treatment options that you find out there in a graphical form from a comparing cost against efficacy. So for example, in this case in which we are exploring uh, wound, wound care for a specific condition called the covetous ulcer, which is, um, is a, a pathology caused by long stays in hospitals where patients either in, with very uh, limited mobility or with non-mobility at all uh, develop uh, Pre, uh, points of very high pressure for them, which derives in ischemia and later on in necrotic tissue, which causes the formation of ulcers, uh, usually in the back or in the legs or in the thighs, um, and eventually can, can cause at the end infections, but basically are very detrimental, um, very detrimental conditions in, uh, in, in mobilized uh, hospital patients. So in this specific case, uh, which I think really clarifies this concept of a treatment uh, cost-benefit analysis, you can see that there are many, uh, many options that we have uh, laid out there, which are not the entire spectrum of options, but it should be the entire spectrum of options. And for example, you have there uh, the concept of compressing dressings, hydrocolors, uh, hydrogels, absorptive dressings, growth factors, skin substitutes or grafts, and other upcoming technologies such as negative pressure dressings. Um, and what you can, you can see there is that we have divided all these uh, problems in a graph, in a bi-dimensional graph, uh, in, in terms of cost and efficacy. And basically what we are doing there is, is, is trying to, to see if there is a gap in, in the treatment, either in, in, in this axis of efficacy or in the axis of cost. What you can see there is that in terms of efficacy, one of the best treatments out there right now is the negative pressure dressing, uh, which has turned out to be a very effective cost, uh, a very effective way to treating to these ulcers, but not a very cost effective way of treating to these ulcers. So even though there are, you know, more che cheaper options for, for treatment of the covetous ulcer uh, wounds, 
a, you know, probably a, a good solution would steer towards a something similar to a negative pressure dressing, but with a cheaper price. As you can see in the graph, uh, some negative pressure dressings uh, actually cost up to uh, $2,000 uh, on sale. And this is a very interesting uh, problem because even though there is an effective option for a certain condition, uh, there is an opportunity to make it better by creating a option that is cheaper and is at least as effective as this um, option. If we go to the second slide, to the next slide, we can see that a, a, we have laid out there an example format on how to evaluate this treatment landscape. So everything that we put on that graph to, to see visually the, the gap on treatment options, we can put in, in a very useful format that can help us to evaluate quantitatively or at least semi-quantitatively um, all the options that there are. So in a useful format, you are always going to have, you know, the name of your treatment option, a category of your treatment option. So what you're going to see is that you're going to be able to cluster some options. So is this, uh, is this group of treatment options non-invasive? Are these treatment options uh, really cheap? Uh, you know, you, you, can, you can create your own clusters, but the thing is that you have to create a um, a section on this format in which you cluster those options and this is going to this is going to be important because you can later on analyze all the treatment by clusters so that it's more manageable as information um, you have to 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 after putting all the name and the category of your treatment option you have to put uh, how it works so what you're going to see is that many treatments uh, use very different, um, very different ways of solving the problem. So some are going to use pharmacological, uh, pharmacological um, backgrounds, and some are going to use uh, essentially mechanical or uh, radio frequency uh, energies to to address a problem. And the thing is that if you don't explicitly say how much, uh, or if you don't explicitly explain how this a certain treatment option works, then you are probably not going to know why that treatment option is, is good or not, or suitable for that patient or not. Um, after that, you, it's very important that you put your, the intention of use. What you're going to see is that many treatments, and a, mostly in the medical device field, all have an intended purpose. Uh, and, and the thing is that even though some treatments can be used off-level for a certain disease, a, what is important from a regulatory standpoint is to put a inten intention of use or an intended purpose. Uh, this, the intended purpose basically defines in what conditions you can and you cannot use that device. And maybe there could be a gap that there is no device out there that has that specific intended use for this specific problem. And so maybe the approach on the treatment landscape is, is, is to make a device a, so safe and effective that you can actually put that intended use on, a, on that treatment option. Uh, after that, there are some standard criteria that you can put. I suggest to put uh, endpoints on safety and efficacy on a, how risk this treatment option is, how costly it is, how attractive it is to, for patients or how attractive it is for clinicians or how attractive it is for nurses. And at the end, you have to put, I recommend to put a, per, a personal scoring system. So after, after knowing that you want to analyze all those uh, characteristics of the treatments because that's relevant for you to know which one is better or more cost effective than others, uh, you have to come up with a scoring system. And it can be, again, a quantitative method or a semi-quantitative method in which you uh, define uh, what each number means. So maybe on safety, 
uh, you can you can divide uh, your range of possible values from one to five or one to ten, uh, meaning one that is completely risky. Uh, comp it's it's very very likely that it's gonna uh, cause a severe adverse event, or it can be a ten saying that uh, explicitly uh, saying that A10 means that is no risk whatsoever for the device. So what you're going to see is that there is going to be a continuum and nuances of, of each and every one of these uh, characteristics and you have to, you, you, you are going to try, you must try to put a certain number on each one of these uh, factors for each one of your treatment options. After that, you you are gonna have a you 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 are gonna have a very well layout of all your treatment, a, all your treatment environment, and uh, you can also perform what we present in the next slide, which is a treatment gap analysis. So after doing your treatment landscape analysis, then you can focus more specifically specifically on the things that you know are missing from the first uh, visual analysis that we did at the, at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, so for example, a, a useful format that is uh, presented uh, on, all the, on the Stanford Bio Design process uh, for doing this is to put again your, uh, your, your treatment option in, and the categor category of, of that treatment option. And then you have to come up with you know, some characteristics that I'm not uh, suggesting. Uh, but some characteristics that are very particular to that uh, to that treatment range of treatment options. So, for example, in in the space of of um, uh, of reduction of weight for morbid obese patients, you might find that there are a there the, there there are a lot of particular characteristics that are important in that space. So, for example, invasiveness. A, effectiveness to, to not prevent the, the patients from uh, absorbing critical micronutrients or um, how, how easy is to place them and how easy is to revert the treatment once the patient has, uh, has reached their gold uh, weight. And whatever it is, you have to put all the important characteristics of that clinical space so that you perform the gap analysis. And the gap analysis, basically, what you want to find is that there are critical characteristics in which all your treatment options are not really that valid. Uh, in this case, for example, you can put a scoring system which is a purely a semi-quantitative with pluses and minuses being uh, two minuses or three minuses, a very uh, bad solution in that uh, specific characteristic and being three pluses, uh, a very, very, very compelling solution in that specific characteristics, characteristic. And what you want to find, again, is that specific characteristic in which all of the treatment options have very poor scoring, okay? Uh, something very important after doing all these formats is to summarize, summarize your treatment options in any way you like. Uh, some, uh, some of the most effective ways of doing this is by uh, doing a, a treatment a option a map in which you first you put your, your critical problem or the clinical, physiological or problematic factor that you want to solve and after that you start layouting lay all the branches of that problem. So for example, atrial fibrillation can express in rhythm disturbances, ventricular disturbances, ineffic inefficiency on pumping, uh, electrical, uh, electrical uh, disturbances and basically for all those little sub-problems of the main problem which is called atrial fibrillation, you are going to have a specific treatment option that is the gold standard for each, a, each one of those disease states. So in this case, it's very important that prior to doing a treatment option analysis, you do your disease state analysis to get a sense of how this a disease, how, how well are these disease states laid out in research right now and where you can attach the treatment options that you have discovered. 
Uh, in this case, for example, you're going to see that you're going to have treatment options that are best applicable in different phases of, of the disease. Uh, and, and that's important because uh, you can also uh, choose to target a specific disease state or a disease root cause for the problem. And well, before going into, into our practical case, uh, a very important consideration for a treatment option analysis is that you have to be as thorough as possible. So the less options you research, the less likely are you going to be of finding all the spectrum of solutions uh, and, and, and the more likely is that you are going to do something that somebody else has done. So the problem with doing a poor treatment option analysis is that you're, if you don't do it, you are not going to know if somebody else has, has solved it and you are not also going to know what's the real gap in that treatment uh, or at least in that treatment landscape. And, and I couldn't be more stronger in this because uh, poor treatment option analysis always uh, always arrive in poor solutions and poor conceptual uh, uh, designs because uh, by not knowing your problem and then by not knowing your competition and what is wrong about it, you cannot make something better. Okay. And well, our practical case of today has to do with asthma. Asthma, as you know, is a, a condition, a, as you can see in the next slide, a condition that is caused by the narrowing of the airways of the bronchi. Uh, it's uh, it affects uh, it affects many millions of uh, of Ameri uh, of people. Uh, it, Ninety percent of the of the people with asthma experience symptoms after you know doing um, a strong exercise uh, of being exposed to some allergenic sources as cat hair or smoke, um, and basically it's a problem that we all know and that currently. It has been addressed by many innovative approaches that I want to explore with you. So, going back into previous lectures, you, 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 for solving this type of problems, you have to know that this is. And one of the critical factors in asthma is that asthma is caused by, by the contraction of the smooth muscles of the bronchi due to a, either swelling or allergy. Aller allergic reactions and what happens is that these muscles are so uh, exercised in, in asthmatic patients that they become thicker and the thicker they become the more likely is that they are going to occlude the airways in an event of allergenic stimulation. If we go into the next slide you can see that uh, a very simple way uh, in, you know and you have to do this more thoroughly but in order to make this shorter, we have laid out all the current treatment options uh, here. So, for example, we have anti-inflammatory drugs, bron bronchodilators, uh, maintenance medications, rescue short-term uh, actions and drugs, medications for long-term control such as Solair, uh, corticosteroids or oral, oral steroids which try to um, contract the side effects of, of uh, inflammation and asthma and of course other drugs and what you can see here is that years back the only current solution treatments that there were were completely pharmacological and, and, and they were costly and they were not permanent and in that way you can create a scoring systems that analyze you know how permanent and how costly solutions are and it was clear years back that there was a need for a more permanent, less pharmacological um, solution for that problem. And, and I, I'm, I'm saying less pharmacological because one of the biggest problems of many of these treatment options were side effects from the medications that were supposed to treat uh, asthma. Uh, after doing a very extensive treatment option analysis and a disease state analysis, a, the company, a, a company called Elair with, a, with its product, a, come up with this idea of bronchial thermoplasty, which is a 
non-pharmacological solution for asthma uh, and that has been very compelling nowadays in the medical device space. So Allure, what, what Allure does is uh, to, to, to try to come up with an effective, uh, long-lasting and more comfortable uh, treatment for asthma. And basically what they come up with is a treatment that it works in over 80 percent in, in almost 80 percent of the patients and that uh, provides a way to prevent almost 84 percent of all asthma asthma related emer emergencies um, you know with better outcomes in a surf safer way with less uh, secondary effects uh, or adverse effects and you know without requiring any sort of medication uh, if we go to the next slide, what you can see is that Alert is basically a catheter that uh, enters orally to your bronchi and what it does is at the tip it has an air RF radio, radio frequency stimulator that goes into the most problematic bronchi, uh, something that is um, determined with previous studies of a uh, lung imaging and basically after the catheter is inserted in the problematic bronchi a uh, radio frequency energy is delivered to that specific bronchi uh, altering the, the the structure of the smooth muscle of that uh, bronchi and basically pre, uh, preventing a uh, excessive narrowing of the airways through a completely non-chemical uh, approach and of course in a more permanent way because uh, basically what, we, what they do is that they uh, burn in a certain way, they burn down a little bit of the muscle that causes the problem so that the muscle is not able to contract that much and effectively reducing all the, uh, reducing the, at the end of the day, the root cause of, of, the, of, of the sensation of uh, not capability of breathing. It, and even though it doesn't target the, 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 the problem of uh, allergenic reactions uh, happening on the bronchi, it does prevent the, the, the secondary effect of bronchi narrowing. Uh, something that I want to, 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 to make it, uh, something that I want to make really clear is that these type of solutions only come from a very in-depth disease state analysis and a treatment option analysis. And by knowing the gaps that there are in current solutions and by knowing if those solutions are targeting or not the most critical factors of uh, the disease or the problematic situation. Okay? And with this we have concluded our um, lecture of today. Uh, if you want to know more about, uh, about treatment option analysis, you can always consult our biodesign book from Seniors uh, in the chapter of treatment option analysis. And see you in next classes. Thank you.